And we are off, folks. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old podcast, I have for you... Oh, wait, just give me one second. I need to turn up the sound in my tins so I can hear myself sensually. We are talking about, in this old one, uh, we are talking about bike rides on my latest masterpiece of audio. Yep, that's something I just said. You know, so we're talking about bike rides, right? And bikes and, like, innocence, they kind of go hand in hand. I mean, you, and oh, when I say you, I mean me. You get these, like, rose-tinted glasses on when, when I think of bicycles. You know, I'm thinking of kids, youth, endless summers. I think of, I think of little Baba Mike, you know, butt-ass naked fat titties swinging around with my big pink helmet on, on my little bike, going, you know, with the bike that dinosaur is on, going around my neighborhood and across the fields that were across from my house, you know, exploring. By the way, that is true. I did have a pink helmet when I was a kid. Um, when I was young, my head was too small for the boys' helmets. That is not a lie. That is a true story. And here, you know what? I have two more true stories for you. And both are only a tad more horrifying than the image I already put in your head of me. Here, we have two stories of of young adults simply going out for for bike rides. Both, in fact, uh, on their way home. Neither would make it home, though. They would instead encounter two, um, dead air. Shitheads. Shitheads, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, but let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before we get into it, my friends, please uh, leave some reviews, Uh, rate the podcast, mucho bueno, Uh, subscribe, follow it, it helps out more than I can ever let you know. If you do, right, I will finally crawl out from under your bed where I've been hiding while you're asleep, and I'll give you a big ol' kiss on the lips. Now, let's give it a goo. Lafayette in Louisiana is our home for for our first story. Uh, Apparently, it's the happiest city in America. What a load of shite. Well, okay, it won't be, I'll tell you this much, it won't be by the time this story is over. Uh, And by the way, self-described, because it didn't make any of the lists I checked. Well, you know what? Anything can be happy. If you believe. It's over two hours west of New Orleans. And in Lafayette, you can get your Cajun and your Creole on. Go out and hunt the gators. Or uh, perhaps, uh, fuck it, I'm not working for Lafayette tourism. It's it's a big city. It's the humble abode of over 120,000 people, if you can believe that. All right, so now now we got to go back in time to 2012. Uh, you, you remember that? 11 years, 11 years ago. My God. The world, uh, in 2012, to set the scene of the year the world was going to end, so we had something to look forward to. The uh, the captain of the Costa Concordia decided to do some sweet-ass moves. He failed, unfortunately. Um, What else happened in 2012? A documentary, a documentary about Coney came out, which, wow. Holy heck. Changed my life. Fuckers still out there, you know, by the way. By that, I mean the scam artist who made the documentary. Coney, too. He is, he's also still out there, by the way. So mad for one man. Man, 2012, you know, there's a theory, one of these, like, crazy conspiracy theories that in 2012, due to CERN, um, the we went into a parallel universe, like, history split, which is why we have stuff like the Mandela effect. Uh, we're in a different timeline now than the one we're supposed to be on, which kind of makes sense because, honestly... Since 2012, things have been going downhill pretty steadily, so thanks, CERN. But, you know, some other shit that year happened too, uh, but we're talking about one incident in particular for this one. And that is the story of Mickey Schunick, who disappeared in May 2012. In 2012, Mickey Schunick was 21 years old. Born on almost the same day, she disappeared. May 21st, 1990. Michaela, she went by Mickey, and she grew up in Lafayette, the middle child with one older sister, Charlene, who who looked identical, like they're they're really, really similar looking, both pretty pale women who had super curly, thick blonde hair, and Mickey had one younger brother, Zach, who did not look like that at all. Charlene and Mickey, though, were close. Uh, Charlene, the more outgoing one, Mickey, a little more uh, reserved. Their parents, Tom, an oil man... And Nancy, a stay-at-home mother, raised their children lovingly. Uh, Mickey, she was a people lover, an animal lover, a horseback rider, and anthropology student at the University of Louisiana in her own hometown. 
And so, as she was studying in town, uh, she lived at home. I mean, be a fool not to. Why move out if it's in the same place where your family house is? And she'd bike around town. You know, the sight of Mickey pedaling like mad around town was a familiar one. And so that brings us to Friday, the 18th of May, 2012. That night, Mickey went out with, with her buds, her birthday only two days away. And, and so they decided to have a night on the town. They went out to a music bar called Artmosphere. That's about, about a 30 minute bike ride from the Shunik home on West Governor Miro Drive. Uh, they were there that night from about 10.15 uh, to almost 1 a.m. Partying away, having a great old time, having some crack. Now, now Lafayette, it's not the safest uh, city in America, but that, that part of town was, was kind of fine. So, so, you know, biking home from there, she should be fine. Also, it wasn't supposed to be a particularly late one. The next morning, Saturday morning, was in fact her brother's graduation day. So the family, they were going to have a like a get-together that morning, go to the brewer's graduation, go out for dinner, that kind of stuff. So after leaving Artmosphere, she went to a friend's house where she hung out from there uh, about quarter to one till almost half one a.m. Then at half one, she left. It was a lovely spring night in Louisiana. She thought it would be a nice ride home. Not so much. When her family awoke the next morning, Mickey was not there. In, in fact, the graduation, her, uh, Zach's graduation came and went. And um, being pissy, being angry at Mickey for missing this changed as the hours went by from, you know, being annoyed to, oh no. You know, calls and calls and calls to her phone went unanswered. Uh, her phone was off. Calls to her friends just deepened the worry. You know, when she was supposed to have come home, she was last seen pedaling in the direction of her own house the previous night. Mickey was reported missing to the police on the 19th of May at 5 p.m. The alerts, they went out at 6.30 p.m. And, and soon the search was on, the entire city taking part with the word spreading. From, from posters to radio appearances, letting everyone know who Mickey was and to keep an eye out. Ideas, ideas came and went as, as to where she could be or what could have happened, you know. Someone out together. The friend she last saw at, at half 1 a.m. before she left. Her, her running away herself. Nope. Nine. Triple nope. Right, right. Not the police or any authority figure, so um, no leads, no evidence, nothing. If you were involved in an accident with your sister, and you did something to hide up maybe an accident. Hence the word accident, there is forgiveness. Give us back, Mickey. Yeah, a mistake is a mistake, you know? I understand people get afraid, especially if maybe you were drinking or something and you just made a mistake. Um, just let somebody know, call the tip line. The route from her friend's house to her own house retraced time and time again. No clues along that road. It's like, it's like she just biked off into the dark bayous of Louisiana. They, too, uh, were searched. Scoured, much like the streets were. Scoured by almost 2,000 people who would eventually visit the Search for Mickey HQ on the University of Louisiana campus. In the meantime, though, the police were going through, through CCTV all along the route Mickey would have taken home. And they saw, they saw her on CCTV casually biking home on her Schwinn in the wee hours of a May weekend. And, you know, in the footage, she was going in the direction she should have been going, right? She was going home. It seemed like she had planned on being there for her brother's graduation. So, they had cameras on her. They, they went along her entire regular route home, finding every camera they could. And they saw her. But unfortunately, there was... Goddamn. This is something like, it's like, it's always, it's always this bullshit where there's a dead spot with no cameras. And then she drives, she, or she cycles into that dead spot, looking grand. She doesn't cycle out. So they have no idea what happened in this one particular area. Whatever happened though, it happened goddamn there. But it helped, so it helped narrow down the search. But it didn't help garner any clues. Other than just one. CCTV showed a white pickup truck that appeared to be following her. A white Chevy Z71. And Mickey's bike was later found under Whiskey Bay Bridge. A bridge that went over a river east of Lafayette. 
the bike was damaged, like someone had hit it, maybe in their pickup truck, maybe with their car, and it was a good bit from where she disappeared, so... So now you're thinking kidnapping more and more likely. Now, unfortunately, though, that white Chevy pickup truck, um... In Louisiana, it turned out, or in this particular area, there's a lot of them. I, I, I wish I could love anything as much as Americans love their pickup trucks. Let me tell you that, folks. But days would go by, ultimately, and the searches dwindled over time. So, during the search, the police, they were very open to the public, you know, constantly pushing out messages, images, CCTV was given to the media. Anyone see this truck? You better say you see this truck, you know, and it led to a few tips came in. Now, there's a few false leads which were worthless, but one that was not so much, and the name Brandon Scott Laverne entered the picture. <sighs> this fucking guy. Brandon was 33 years of age, and he worked on oil rigs in the Gulf. He was living in the small town of Church Point, north of Lafayette, and someone who saw the news, saw the CCTV, pointed the finger at him, saying that A, this guy they knew, Brandon, he'd been away the weekend Mickey went missing, and after he appeared, he didn't even just appear to, he came back injured with scratches all over his face around that time, and he had that white, he had that same white pickup truck that now he no longer had for some weird reason, and finally, he had a record. A real, a real nasty one, by the way, you're a real sack of shit, this guy. Oh, by the way, He's a real sack of shit, and I didn't even mention he's a Saints fan, so that'll tell you what kind of person he is. Got that. Brandon was saying when this friend asked that the weekend Mickey vanished, he had been in New Orleans, and he had been mugged by some randomer, hence his injuries. But he didn't live close to the city, and he had no reason to be there. He also claimed that his white pickup had been stolen after Mickey vanished. So, what exactly was this Brandon Katz record? Well, in 1999, Brandon broke into a woman's house. He tied her up and sexually assaulted her. Shortly after, he got married. What a lucky, lucky lady. And within a few months, his newly beloved accused him of beating her and trying to smother her to death. He was booked on assault for that one, but it, but it never went to trial. Then, the following year, he was arrested for a break-in, and he was charged with aggravated oral sexual battery, and he would be sentenced to 10 years, serve eight of them, getting out in 2008. The police know they were pretty interested in this story about Brandon, and the alleged mugging, <laughs> the alleged mugging he had suffered, poor guy, you know. So they wanted to check it out, they, they asked him, oh hey Brandon, you know, a few questions for you, here you were mugged, uh, oh it happened at a gas station you say, okay. The police would go to that gas station and what a surprise, wow! CCTV showed he never went to that gas station and there was no mugging there. So with all that, he became suspect number one. They just needed to see if there was any clear links between him and Mickey, whatever happened to her. Well, he also reported that his truck had been stolen and was purchasing a new truck that was the exact same as the one uh, he claimed was stolen. So, the police following up on this, they contacted his insurance, and following a, a later police report, the police would find his old truck burnt out across the border in Texas, but it had been burnt out so badly that nothing was of value or of any usefulness. All it did, though, was give them his license plate, from which they could confirm he had not been in New Orleans that weekend. He'd been in Lafayette. Then, following some markings that were on the truck, it matched the one seen in the CCTV following Mickey. So, they brought him in, and he said absolutely nothing. Now, this was not the first murder Brandon Scott Laverne was linked to. In 1999, the same year he broke uh, into his house and, and got married, uh, a woman named Elisa Pate vanished. She was from Youngsville, just outside Lafayette, and she was supposed to be at her young son's birthday. But she was not. She was found three months later behind a house in rural Louisiana, again not far from Church Point. Now, it was impossible to determine how exactly she died. They had to identify her via her dental records, but Brandon was linked to her murder. Now, how exactly, I, I wish I could tell you. Not much about Lisa Page has ever been kind of released, but I do know that it never went through the legal system due to insufficient evidence. That was not happening in the Mickey Shunick case. 
a case in which they didn't know exactly uh, what happened, but they did feel they had enough to take this to trial. Though, though usually, you know, as we see again and again, when you're taking a case to trial, if you don't have a body, it's kind of tough. So they needed to get it. And so they said to Brandon, we will take the death penalty off the table. It's off the table. Just tell us where Mickey is. He said yes. What happened that night was this. He had been driving around that night, aimlessly, calling escort services, um, something he was a big fan of, by the way, even though he was engaged to another woman at this stage. At one point, he saw Mickey, and for some reason, um, nefarious reason, he followed her and then hit her with his car, and she obviously went flying off her bike. When she was on the ground, he put her bike into the bed of his truck and whipped out a knife and a pistol and forced Mickey to get into his truck. Now, little did Brandon over here know, she had pepper spray and she sprayed the shite out of him. She then grabbed his knife off of him while he was obviously in pain with pepper spray in his eye and stabbed the fucker, hence his injuries. She began stabbing the shit out of him. However, he managed to overpower her. He took the knife back and he stabbed her. He stabbed her a lot. He stabbed her to what he thought was death. And then he put her in the truck and he drove. However, she wasn't dead. She regained consciousness and she grabbed the knife once again and attacked him once again. At this point, though, Brandon, he grabbed the gun and he shot her in the head. He then, he then tried to bury her, but due to his wounds, he couldn't. So he hit her body, he dumped her bike, he drove to the Eeyore in New Orleans, making up a story about how he had been mugged. He then returned and he buried Mickey properly in rural Evangeline Parish, north of Lafayette. He then burned his truck as it was covered in his blood and, and Mickey's blood, and he bought the exact same model. I guess he just really loved that truck. God damn, though, like, fair play to Mickey. She was a fighter. She really fought for everything, and she gave, she gave it to him. She really did. Brandon, he would also agree, by the way, to plead guilty to the murder of Elise Pate. It seems he had met her shortly before she disappeared and convinced her to go out of town with him where he suffocated her. So he pled guilty to two murders and ultimately was sentenced to two life sentences in August 2012. He changed his mind though. Um, after that, after he was sentenced, sent away, booked up, um, he changed his mind and said, actually, you know what? Um, uh, I lied. I made all that shit up. Literally six months after he was sent away, he asked the judge, um, can I take that, uh, uh, can I take that back? Um, the, the the judge said no take backs. In retaliation uh, for that, he decided to deny himself food. Um, he's like, well, if you're not going to take back my plea, I'm just not going to eat. I think, though, he was under the assumption that society values rapists and murderers and would really give a shit. Bit odd. He attempted also to escape prison. Uh, he basically made it two steps, though, outside the gates before he was rugby tackled and dra they dragged the fucker back in. He appealed uh, his sentence as much as he could, but was shut, shut, shut down each time. Most recently in February 2022, which is great stuff. There is now Mickey's Loop, a memorial bike ride to honor all uh, who were killed while biking. Because we have one more. And, and if you thought Laverne was a real piece of shit, Wait till you get a load of this next guy. Brandon Scott Laverne and James Worley were a match made in a septic tank. Now we're off to Fulton County, more like empty county, am I right? It's home to roughly 42,000 people um, and a hell of a lot more corn than just that. It's located at the tippity top of Ohio and um, wow, that's probably the quickest I've ever run out of things to uh, talk about, honestly. It's, it's Ohio, I mean, that's literally all you really need to know. That's pretty much all I can say because unlike bustling, you know, Lafayette in the story I just told you, this story takes place pretty much entirely around cornfields. Yeah, look forward to that. Lots of big, long, empty roads surrounded by children of the corn. Something, I guess, kind of haunting about that, you know, spooky. Getting lost in a cornfield. Is there monsters in the cornfield? 
shit happening in cornfields, uh, essentially, to cut a long story short. Well, that's uh, this story. What's important, though, is out of the 42,000 people who lived in Fulton County in the year of 2016, one of them was Sierra Jockin. Sierra was born in 1996 to Tom and to Sheila. Sierra was the first child in the family doted upon by her parents. Now, now, Sierra would be followed by two brothers and two sisters, but Sierra would always be number numero uno. She was confident, she loved traveling, and she loved to laugh. She graduated from Evergreen High School in Fulton County, and from there she entered university, the big leagues. She was studying business at the University of Toledo, less than an hour from home, and she wanted to, as a career, work in human resources. In the summer of 2016, as she was getting ready for her junior year at university, I don't know why I'm saying it like that, she was going steady with a fella named Josh Kolosinski. They had been dating a long old time at this point, seven years. Uh, I guess kind of what you could imagine a small town high school relationship would be, that kind of thing. Um, now that summer, the summer of 2016, 20 year old Sierra was interning at an uncle's business, but it was, it was a pretty chill, you know, summer internship. That summer, it was hot, and, and Sierra was enjoying it before it was, you know, before it was back to school, time to hit the books once more. And an especially hot day was Tuesday the 19th of July, right in the middle of a Midwestern summer. Sierra, she had recently gotten a new bike at a local garage sale, and at around 5pm that day, she was planning on taking it out for a spin. She was going to bike over to her boyfriend Josh's, which was about, about 7 miles away, and hang out with him for a little while. As I said at the top of this, this is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Just picture long, straight roads, tall, green corn stalks on all sides. You know, farms, barns, and nothing else out there. So she said to her mother, I'll get you on the flip side, and pedaled away. Now Sarah's mother, Sheila, she had an evening class that day, that very day, so she left the house herself at around 5pm, and then her mother returned at about 9.30pm to a Sierra Less house. Now, she didn't think anything of that though. Um, you know, her daughter, Sierra, would be at her boyfriend's house, who was just a few miles away, and it's the middle of summer, so... You know, 9.30 p.m. and summer is not, is not late. But at about an hour later, as 11 p.m. approached, the boyfriend she thought she was with called, asking where she was. Josh would say Sierra hadn't texted him back since they last saw each other about four hours earlier. Josh told Sheila that he'd been trying to get in touch with Sierra for hours, that they'd, they'd gone out for a little spin together before they parted ways at about 6.45pm. He had returned home and she was supposed to be doing the same, but obviously she never made it when Sheila's mother arrived home at half nine. Now these are quiet country roads, there's absolutely no reason for her not to have arrived. Uh, you know, there would be little traffic on it. But combined with no answer on the cell phone, things start to become worrying. And then the first thought was, okay, you know, we're, we're gonna do, we're gonna drive around, and she'll be in a ditch, courtesy of farming equipment, trucks, whatever. No. That night, her family contacted the police, and they reported her missing. And so the police, they themselves were like, all right, you know, we'll go out, we'll have a goo, we'll see if we can find her. And at close to midnight, an officer was driving down County Road 6, and he saw some corn that had been knocked over. So, heading over to have a look, he saw something odd. A small fuse, like maybe one from a motorbike. And then he was... This is fucking weird, lads. He was checking around, right? He saw two pairs of sunglasses, and then, catching a reflection of his flashlight further in, he saw Sierra's bike. This was not looking good. And this was not far at all from her home. She'd almost reached it. And then, something happened. There were also bloodstains on the handlebars and the seat of her bike. One of, one of her socks was beside, and also a bloody screwdriver. And, and also tracks, uh, as if from a motorbike. It looked like someone had tried to hide her bike in a field, and then, you know, well, thoughts are... Someone had, 
had kidnapped her. That, that's what began to percolate. And the searches found out from there. You know, flyers asking around if anyone, anyone saw a thing, any, any leads. And they got one. They got one. A farmer who had been driving down that exact same road the crime scene was on after 7 p.m. He saw something. He saw on the side of a road a motorcycle helmet. And so this farmer, he, he grabbed it and he went on his merry way. He handed it over and on that motorcycle helmet were more stains, blood stains and some fingerprints. It, it, what it looked like, and it was obviously a motorcycle helmet, so pretty hard. It looked like it, the helmet had been used as a weapon, like boom, someone had smacked somebody in the head with it. At this point, it came up. Whoever did this was on a bike and Josh had been on a bike. He had a motorcycle and in fact, well, you know, he had been with Sarah that day. Her on her body, you know, so, but he was quickly, he was quickly, Josh was ruled out. He hadn't done anything to his girlfriend. I know we usually, it's the last person they were with, but honestly, it didn't seem like at this time. He, all his stuff was accounted for. His helmet was accounted for. No stains, no evidence found linking him to it. So the search continued. But as the hours passed, the chances of finding Sierra alive, they started to dwindle one by one. And the search was like finding a needle in a haystack, a Sierra in a cornfield. So the police then next, they started to, okay, she's probably been kidnapped. We need a list of who could have done this type list. They got one. They got a, they put together a list of all convicted felons in the area and we're gonna go to each and every one, knocking on the dough. One was James D. Worley, who lived close by with Mother Dearest. Now, James, when he was questioned by police, he was defensive from the get-go. The police, they looked through his house and, folks, if I could show you the picture, you can find the pictures of his house online. It's the type of house you can smell from the images. Uh, shithole comes to mind. So the police, they toured his gaff, then they went out to, to the barnyards. Uh, one of them was like a, a garage he worked on, where he worked on. Bikes, motorcycles of all things. Hope they asked him where his helmet was. Keep the noodle safe. Then they went to another barn. And as soon as the police went into this particular barn, James was sweating bullets as soon as they stepped in. In that barn were a load of hay bales. Square, like these square hay bales stacked on top of each other. Like a hay bale fort, almost. But the police saw on the ground marks as if, as if someone had swept up recently. And the hay bales looked like they had been they had been moved, like there were drag marks. So they snooped around. And under the hay was this like little cage type thing. And inside they found women's lingerie and that sort of stuff. Like some weird sh sexual deviancy bullshit in here. And so the police were like, well, James, you want to explain this maybe? Uh, it's from a girlfriend, guys. Oh, it's from a girlfriend. She likes the cage. She likes to get in it and crawl around sometime. It's her thing. Inside were numerous pairs of women's underwear. All were nearly new, apart from one bloody piece of underwear. And so James was taken in. But James, his explanation for, for this um, was he was going to be a big cat in the slap a ham industry out of his barn in Ohio. Literally, that is what he said. That was his excuse for them finding this cage um, with women's underwear was he was filming porn. Guys, I'm just filming some good old porn, you know, hence the cage and all that. Nothing to do with Sierra, the girl who went missing near here. None at all. A full search then of the Whirly property was undertaken and moving about more hay bales, they found a little sick little fuck set up here. In the same barn uh, the cage was in, a mattress was found there and it looked like he was setting up a uh, yeah, it's like the world's worst porn shoot because I don't think anybody's going to do this willingly. God love any woman who would set their foot in there. They then found a board on the floor with holes cut in and pulling it up under the ground, like buried under the barn was a freezer. He had a goddamn fridge freezer down there. Now inside it was empty, but they opened the fridge door and it was carpeted on the inside. Jeez Louise, like it was going to be a little prison where he would lock somebody in the freezer. There was zip ties in there, duct tape, ropes to bind, and pepper spray. Like, this is some real sick shit. This is even more somehow disturbing than, you know, it puts it gets it puts the lotion on the skin or it gets the hose. Like, like was he going to put somebody in his little fridge freezer? 
as some kind of like prison cage type thing. Man, that's friggin messed up. That's like being buried alive. But through all this, no Sierra. Now, the reason James was on the cop radar, the cops radar at all was due to prior convictions. James himself, he was 57 years old in 2016, and although he was born in Washington State, he grew up himself in Fulton. He actually graduated from the same school Sierra did. Now, he worked odd jobs, not really exactly a secure, you know, employment type of guy. Farmer here, groundskeeper there, but he mainly got by selling the, the good old devil's lettuce. However, his record began was what happened in July 1990, 26 years to the month before our story, something eerily similar to what maybe happened, actually happened. On the 4th of July, 1990, Robin Gardner, a 26 year old woman, was riding down country roads in Fulton on her bike when all of a sudden a truck knocked her down into the ditch. Out popped James with a screwdriver and held it to her throat saying, get in the truck or I'm gonna fucking kill you. So all of that sounds exactly similar to what could possibly have happened to Sierra. The evidence was matching. So Robin, fearing for her life, she got in the truck. But when James, he tried to handcuff her, she managed to just about open the door and bucket down this country road. She flagged down a passing motorcycle and told him, yo, this guy's gonna kill me. James is gonna kill me. While James was running up saying, hey, don't, don't listen to her. She's cuckoo. She's great. She didn't take her pills today. He stayed till the police arrived and James was arrested. The police did believe her. James, he was convicted on abduction charges and he served three years of a four to 10 year sentence. He would later, by the way, that wasn't his only spell. He would later return to prison in 2000 on growing weed and having a gun while on disability charges. But um, he was out uh, for two, uh, he was out after two for that. And then it seems he stayed pretty quiet for the next 14 years while Sierra grew just down the road. That is until July, 2016. But when the police, they got that, you know, that warrant to search his place, they so they were digging into James, they found these things, they found what happened to Robin, which is like, well, geez, that sounds like it could exactly be what happened to Sierra. They also found this quote from his court mandated therapist. The therapist said, James, he learned from each abduction he had done and the next one he was going to bury. Now that makes it sound like there's a lot more abductions than just Robin. James was a very sick individual. How much he has done? I don't know, but it seems like he could have done a lot with what the police found. A witness would later say they saw a van driving at high speed in the area Sierra was bicycling through. The plates of that van were linked to James. The helmet that was his, his cell phone data showed he was in the area of the crime scene when Sierra went missing, and combined with the items found in his barn, he was arrested on abduction charges on the 22nd of July. And so with all of this, uh, with his previous history and things he had said, being a serial offender and perhaps even a serial killer began to come under mind. Um, but with all of that, they searched the shit out of James's his, his shit hole. They found neither Sierra nor anybody else. Whatever he did, it looked like he had done it on his property, but he didn't leave any traces behind. That was until the 22nd of July, when Sierra was, she was finally found. A farmer discovered, well, a patch of dirt in his field a few miles from James's place, and this farmer called the police. They dug up that patch of dirt and they smelt that smell of decomposition, and there she was. Sierra, she had been hogtied, she had been gagged, and she was wearing a diaper. There was a gag in her mouth, asphyxiating her. Though it didn't appear, despite all of this, that she had been sexually assaulted, though I'm sure that was on his mind. James Worley was charged with murder, kidnapping, abduction, tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, amongst other indictments, and he pled not guilty to everything. His trial began in March of 2018. So what happened that day? It's believed be this. <laughs> Going through his history, they could find a lot of this. So after watching porn all day, uh, according to his web history, he was Having a great old day, you know, just, just another day cranking it. 
James saw at his window Sierra biking home minutes after she left Josh. Then, seeing her and his, his gears grinding, he got on his motorcycle, he got ahead of her, and then as she cycled past him, he managed to strike her with his helmet with full force. He then dragged her into the corn, her bike also, and tied her up. Then he left her there in the cornfield and went back to his house to get his van. Leave, she, he just left her there. What he, in fact, what he actually did was he called his brother to get a lift back to his place, saying his bike broke down, hence, you know, they found a fuse. Evidently, when his brother came to pick him up, he didn't see anything odd, though. So James then came back to where Sierra was, where he kept her in his van, and then he took her to his barn. Her DNA was found on the mattress, on underwear, on duct tape. James' DNA was, was on that too. He physically assaulted her. He gagged her with some kind of dog toy, which broke a tooth. That's how forcefully he shoved it into her mouth. This then caused her to suffocate, at which point he then buried her a couple of miles away, two feet deep, though I'd say if she didn't suffocate, she might have had a worse end. He denied it all, though. He said the stuff found it was for my porno studio guy, you know, bum, bum, bum. she was going to do that whole thing. You know, I'm going to get a few lucky ladies in here and make them famous. The items his helmet found, that had, he had left them earlier when his bike broke down. He had nothing to do with any kind of um, woman missing the blood on it. Don't know how that got there. co ink edink at trial, Robin Gardner, the survivor, she testified. The prosecution day presented recordings from James's sister, and his sister even mentioned he had been suspected in two other murders. Also, he'd been suspected of involvement in the disappearance of a 14-year-old girl named Lori Ann Hill. She disappeared um, after leaving a Halloween party. Her naked body found four days later. That remains unsolved, but James being a prime suspect in it. In the end, James was found guilty, with the jury recommending the death penalty for you, boyo. At some instant, though, James's defense was, uh, guys, I've been set up. Someone's out to get me. They're, they're, they're out to make me look bad. And he also said, hey, guys, if I had actually done it, it would have been a hell of a lot worse than what happened. So that's how you know I didn't do it, because I would have given her an even worse death. Hello, everyone. Since the onset of this thing, I have been instructed to remain silent and to say nothing. And that is good advice to just anyone who is in any kind of predicament. The less you say, the better off you are. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that myself, my family, everyone that I know is harder for the job and family. Make no mistake. Now, the person who used my home, who found it after I lost it, I truly believe she was attacked. And then my big goofy shows up with my body. He's got her subdued. I don't know where. I don't have those answers. He took that home and he left the palm to come over. The DNA found under her fingernails, not my DNA. And during the two or three days he had Sierra, I believe she was walked. Literally kept under, under, subdued, and kept under control. Don't ask me why she wasn't there. She was a beautiful girl, but she wasn't, and I'm glad. Um, wow, you, you shockingly, guys, you'd be shocked to hear this. That didn't help James's case at all. And the judge laid the smack down on James Douchebag Worley. The jury recommended the death penalty, the judge upheld it, and he also got a combined 23 years for other charges. Now James's execution has been delayed twice, and in January 2021, his defense appealed for a new trial, arguing that this person wasn't fair. No word on that one, but I mean, if I'll, I'll eat my own shoe if he gets a new trial. As for Sierra, her memory, it, it, it's still honored. With walks and runs in her memory, a scholarship was set up, as was justice for Sierra, which provides safety training. Uh, James's barn, the Whirly Barn on the property, has been destroyed. But, but, in August of 2020, the FBI, along with the Sheriff's Office, began to search it once more. 
uh, what tipped them off, what they were hoping to find. Who knows? Um, but maybe he, as I said, I mean, he's been linked to a couple of other disappearances and murders. Maybe they think they might find something. Maybe there's a lot more names behind James Worley than first thought, but God only knows. And that ends this whole story. You know, two stories of young women biking home and then being, you know, encountering a monster or predator. Both stories are so similar. I mean, both um, victims seem very similar and both suspects are very similar. Both have long criminal histories. Both did pretty much the exact same thing to their victim. It's really fucking bizarre but hence why i'm telling them both to you in this one podcast i mean they're so similar it makes sense to put them together but yeah um they both suck um one is being sentenced to death the other may as well be with life without parole Thank you so much for listening to this old one. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did uh, enjoy telling it to you. Um, as I said, guys, if you could leave ratings, reviews, follow, subscribe, it helps out so, so much. Um, really, I don't think I'll, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't thank you enough if you did. Um, but yeah, remember two podcasts every week from your boy, Hey, yeah. Also, one YouTube video every week on Tuesdays, so check all these things out. But until the next one, please take care of each other and yourselves because you know it. I love you. Mike out. <laughs>